Hi, welcome to handout 15, Introduction to Entity Valuation. In this handout, we're going to pull together a lot of the things we've learned recently, like time value of money, discounted cash flow valuation methods, and probabilistic measures of risk, and put these all together to help us value the equity of various entities. The equity meaning the stock, meaning if we bought 100% of the stock, how much should it would it cost us? And then we'd own 100% of the firm. So as usual, without any further ado, let's jump right in. So first, let's think a little bit about why we care about entity valuation in the first place. Entity valuation comes up in many areas of finance and other related areas. So for example, if we are something like a PE firm, we might want to ask the question, should we buy this firm? Also, we might be a competitor of a firm in the same industry, like for example, JetBlue, thinking of buying Continental. Um, and we might also be what's called an industry aggregator. And that would be the case where we have a mom and pop kind of industry with no big players across the nation. And we've set out to buy a bunch of them and become a commanding nationwide player. And in these cases, when we're asking this question, do we want to buy the firm, the valuation could be done by a PE firm, an investment bank for an industry aggregator. They might pay an investment bank to do it for them. An M&A firm, if an M&A firm is pitching to, for example, JetBlue, that maybe they should buy United Airlines, they would go ahead and do that as part of their, part of their pitch. And in-house teams for industry aggregators might do it themselves. And there are other consultants that do valuations. West End Advisors, my firm has done valuations for some small companies, for example. Another reason that we care about valuing companies is to establish an equity market value. So if you have a privately held company, for example, um, it's hard to figure out what the value should be. And some of the techniques that we're going to learn uh, in this chapter will help us out with that. So this would be the case, for example, with shareholders. If we're shareholders of a startup, it hasn't gone public yet. We want to know what our shares are worth. Judges do this type of thing in bankruptcy. The IRS does this type of thing to make sure that firms aren't misrepresenting themselves and potential investors for startups like uh, VC venture capital firms uh, want to have a good estimate of equity market value. So to answer this kind of question, investment banks can do this type of work or other consultants. And we're also going to be interested in coming chapters in using entity valuation to help us maximize shareholder value of the firm or stakeholder value of the firm. So this is typically an internal type of valuation that might be set out by the board of directors and asking the CEO to ask the CFO to do this. It might also be done by a group of minority shareholders who feel like a given firm isn't run as well as it could be. And if, if the firm were changed around a bit, its value would go up. Uh, so again, this type of work could be done by entities in-house teams, like the CFO's team, uh, for investment banks who might be doing this for minority shareholders or for the board of directors and, and other consultants. Another time we want to know the valuation of an entity is simply if we want to know, should we buy some shares of the stock of the company? And we've seen the types of investors that want to do this and do this, in fact, all the time. Typically, value investors like, for example, Warren Buffett, hedge funds do this all the time. Should we buy 5% of the shares of Google? Yes or no. And mutual funds do this all the time. And in this case, this will usually be done by the mutual funds, the hedge funds, funds, Warren Buffett's uh, in-house teams. Um, there are also analysts at the investment banks that will do this and provide their analysis to hedge funds, mutual funds, things, things like that. Okay, so as we can see, entity valuation, very important, comes up in many different contexts. So what are our valuation methods? Okay, we've beat this drum to death a bit, but first one we learned was the balance sheet valuation method. 
It's good for steady state entities. The problems with it is it's very hard oftentimes to figure out market value of assets. When we looked at HCP, the REIT in the first class, for example, valuing what each of their medical labs, each of their hospitals is putting a market value on each one is difficult and takes a lot of time. And also putting a value on assets that GAP doesn't even account for is difficult. Things like brand names. What would the brand, the Apple brand, sell for if Apple sold itself to Lenovo? I don't know. If we asked everyone in the class, we'd get different answers and we'd probably want to take an, an average and look at the standard deviation and stuff like that. So the balance sheet valuation method is difficult. So alternately, we have our discounted cash flow methods or DCF methods, NPV, IRR, BCR. And as we've learned, the NPV method is good for any project. And that's pretty awesome. So we're going to use it for entity valuation. So our NPV method, as we all know, is we get the NPV, which is equal to the sum of every stinking cash flow for this player, for this project. Take each flat cash flow, individually discount them back to t equals zero, add them up, and that's the NPV. If the NPV is greater than zero, the model's telling us it's a good project. If it's less than or equal to zero, pass on it. So now let's assume that we are buying a firm. So if we're buying a firm, we can rewrite the NPV equation to be more directly applicable to the situation with entities here. We can say that the NPV is equal to minus PP plus the discounted value of all the future cash flows after we purchase the firm. So PP in this case is the price that we pay for the firm. So the NPV will be a big negative cash flow at t equals zero, the price that we pay for the firm. Then what do we get for that? We get the present value of all the future values of the firm. So looking at this in words, it looks like this. We have the price paid for the firm, and that's going to be negative. And then what we get are the present values of all those future cash flows. And again, PP is what we pay now for the right to get all those future cash flows. We get the right by owning 100% of the shares of the firm. So now we want to know in this equation, what are the correct cash flows and what's the correct discount rate to use here? So let's assume we're going to finance the purchase of the firm with our own cash, which we'll call E, and a loan, which we'll call D. So in general, we're going to need to know what the PV is to the owners, that would be the shareholders, the equity holders, or the debt holders, that would be loans or bonds. We take out a loan or we could issue bonds to make this work. And also to all stakeholders, debt holders and shareholders. And for each of these cases, we need to know what are the appropriate cash flows to use and what are the appropriate opportunity, what is the appropriate opportunity cost of capital to use. So let's start with the appropriate cash flows for valuing entities. The appropriate cash flows for valuing entities, the cash flows we're going to get out of the entity if we go ahead and own it, are called free cash flows. So this is very important. You really need to know what free cash flows are. Okay. And the definition of free cash flow for an entity is the maximum amount of cash we can remove from the firm in a period without impairing its future operations. So this is FCF for an entity. So that's the definition. This is an important one to know. And now we got to think about what does this mean if we're valuing the firm for all stakeholders? And what does it mean if we're valuing the firm for just owners? So if we're valuing the firm for all the stakeholders, then we'd be getting FCFD plus E, okay? And 
what that is going to be is the free cash flow before any interest is paid because the interest gets paid to the debt holders and we're always going to assume that the debt maturities are simply rolled over so in other words if we have a five-year loan for five million dollars at the end of the five years we go to the bank and they say oh, okay we'll give you another five-year loan for the same amount that's what rolling over means and if we are interested in valuing the firm just for the owners, not for all the stakeholders, but just for the owners, then we're going to be interested in FCF sub E, which are the free cash flows available to owners in this case, just the owners. So these are going to be free cash flows that occur after interest has been paid to the debt holders. So the, some of the key features of these cash flows, for, for all of them, they're always going to be adjusted for project-specific risk, and we're always going to compute our cash flows after the entity pays its income tax. So these are going to be called after-tax cash flows. If we're getting the cash flows to all the stakeholders, to the debt holders and the equity holders, these are called unlevered free cash flows. And Again, these are the free cash flows before any interest is paid, which means they're available to pay interest, to pay the debt holders, and to pay the owners. On the other hand, if we're getting our free cash flows just to owners, these are called levered free cash flows. And the reason that they're levered is because they occur after interest is paid, and these are the cash flows that are available to the owners. So you need to know this too, unlevered free cash flows are for all stakeholders, levered free cash flows are for owners. So now let's look at some formulas to compute the NPV of an entity that we're thinking of purchasing. Again, I want to look at this from the point of view of owners and all stakeholders. So if we're looking from the point of view of owners, right, E, and then we're going to get value of the equity. So we could say NPV E, standing for NPV to the shareholders, is equal to minus P comma E. What does that mean? That's the price that the owner is paid to buy the firm. And as we know from our look at conservatives and cowboys earlier in the semester and a couple of other examples, um, if we set out to buy a firm, we don't have to use all of our money to buy 100% of the shares. We can use some of our money and we can get the firm to take out a loan to buy the rest. So that's why we've got P sub P comma E, okay? Because that's the cost put in by the owners to get the shares. And then here, we're just going to call the free cash flows FCF sub E comma I. I stands for the year of that cash flow. And I will equal one to N for as long as we own the firm or till the firm collapses or something about that. We'll talk about where to cut off N a little bit later. And now we want to be discounting with the appropriate cost of capital for equity, ROCC comma E. And that's going to be something that like what we get out of CAPM. Okay, on the other hand, um, if we're valuing the firm for all the stakeholders, for the debt holders and the equity holders, and that's what's called enterprise value. We learned about that in our ratio analysis chapter. Right? If we're valuing a firm for all the stakeholders, debt plus equity, that's called enterprise value. And if we're valuing it just for equity holders, it's called the equity value. So this is going to look very similar, except now we're going to say this is the price to buy all of the firm's debt and equity. Okay, um, and I'll explain more about that in a second. And these are going to be these unlevered cash flows that are available to all stakeholders here. And then we're going to have to have a different opportunity cost of capital that applies to all stakeholders. So we have a cost of capital here just for shareholders, and we have a different cost of capital here if we're valuing to everybody. So a little bit more on this uh, price to purchase the firm for everybody. So like I said, this is the cost to purchase all of the equity and all of the debt of the firm. And what do I mean by change of 
control put here? Well, actually, this is something that can happen very frequently. Let's say that you own a firm and the equity, the market value of the equity of the firm is, say, 100 million equity, and you have 100 million loans for this firm. And I come along and I want to buy the firm. And I tell you, I'll pay 100 million for your equity for the firm, no problem. And you say, okay, great. So we think we have a deal. And as far as you're concerned, we do have a deal. But I got problems because your lender, let's say your lender for your firm is JP Morgan Chase. And Jamie Dimon takes a look at you and takes a look at me. And he says, you know, I know you. You've done a great job with this firm. You're managing it really well. I don't know anything about this stinking Webster fella. And I think he might blow up the firm. He might manage it badly. He might do badly. So guess what? If he's going to own the firm, if the control of the firm changes, then I'm going to demand that all the principal of the loans I've loaned you have to be repaid immediately. And Jamie Dimon's not stupid. When you took out a loan contract with him, he put that in the loan contract. So you don't care, that, that's fine. But I do care because now all of a sudden I have to come up with 100 million to pay you for 100% of the shares, but I've also got to come up with 100 million to pay back Jamie Dimon uh, for the loan. So what could I do? I could go to another bank, maybe Deutsche Bank, and say, hey, I'm buying this great firm loan the firm $100 million, and the proceeds of that loan would go to pay Jamie Dimon at the time the firm was sold, something like that. So that's what we mean here by this change of control put. And it's true, it's true, it's, it's really true. Oftentimes when you buy a firm, even though all you care about is owning 100% of the shares, you also have to refinance the debt. You have to come to an agreement with the current lender, or you've got to find a new lender to pay off the current lender when you buy the firm. Okay, enough of that.